Hello and welcome to All Space Considered, everyone. I'm Dr. David Reitzel, and I'm coming to you live from Griffith Observatory. As always, All Space Con Considered is brought to you by Griffith Observatory, the City of Los Angeles, the Department of Recreation and Parks, and as always, we like to thank our exclusive nonprofit partner, Griffith Observatory Foundation. In fact, tonight, much of our show is made possible by Griffith Observatory Foundation. You're going to hear all about that. As you can see here, we have a bunch of different stories. We have Chasing for the Stream with our astronomical observer, Vanessa Alarcon. We have reports from the Path of Totality with a bunch of different astronomy staff, Griffith Observatory staff here. Um, words from an Umbra file from uh, our foundation board member, Tricia Nelson. We also have myself talking about why we chase and we have the Mexico report from our very own observatory director, Dr. Edwin C. Krupp. Um, he could not be here live tonight, so we have a recorded segment from him, but nonetheless, it is fascinating all about the trip they took there. Well, tonight, indeed, these stories are all a little mixed up. We'll go back and forth between them, but uh, each person will come up on the stage. We decided tonight we would talk from the lectern, unlike we normally do. We will go back to our chairs, don't worry. But we're talking from here tonight tonight because we wanted to make the theater extra dark. We have a lot of really spectacular imagery tonight and we wanted to preserve that the best we could. By the way, the folks that are helping usher the theater, go ahead and let folks seat a little bit late if there's anybody that comes late, just have them come in quietly. Well, indeed, we had an eclipse on April 8th and this was the path that it was scheduled to take and it actually followed that path, amazingly so, physics had it right. Um, you could see the little words there, GE and GD, that's the greatest eclipse. That's based upon, well, if you had a flat Earth, which we don't. I don't mean a spherical Earth, but there were no mountains on it, um, no elevation, no relief. That's sort of the moment that the moon is closest, where the shadow is biggest to us, and you get the longest amount of the eclipse. The greatest duration, however, is calculated using that. That's the GD. That's calculated using things like, well, you're in a valley or you're in a mountain peak. Well, that's the location. If you went right to that spot, you would experience the longest eclipse, actually. Well, a lot of folks chose to come to Griffith Observatory. I, I'm not sure why we were not having an event that day, but of course people love Griffith Observatory and rightfully so. We are a wonderful location to come up and celebrate something like this, but technically we had no event. Well, we were prepared for the no event that you see right there. You see the news crew and the news vans in the background. They come up here, of course, for an eclipse. We were prepared for all of that, but we also let people know you don't need to come here. You can see this elsewhere. In fact, this eclipse, less of the sun was covered than the annular eclipse we had last year. So the one last year was a better opportunity. We did let folks experience it with the Celestat here. As you can see, this is one of our museum guides. Um, I think this might be Derek. I'm not sure if it is. I'm holding up a little card there. With that card, it has a black spot. That's how big the Earth is. So the Earth is that large, and there's actually a, a sunspot under the card there as well that's about the size of the Earth. We'll show you that again. Now, other folks did celebrate this eclipse. NASA did. They were planning on launching some rockets. So this is the one little science report you're going to get about this. Believe it or not, this is reports of the or, or, uh, measurements in the upper ionosphere. This is sort of the charged layer of the atmosphere, and that's an eclipse happening. And they measure different amounts of charged particles. Weird things happen. We don't fully understand why. So the folks at NASA decided they would launch some rockets into the path of totality. Three, in fact. So there goes one. I like how, the, the, I mean, those are going fast. Hard to track. I don't, I don't blame them. And now here's the second one. Yeah, they look, they look pretty small compared to what we're used to with the big Falcon 9s and all of that. But these were able to get up there into the ionosphere and make some measurements. And then there is a third one that gets launched. But I'm going to move on. Um, meanwhile, I wasn't here at Griffith Observatory. I had brought uh, this best traveling companion I could have with me to Texas. I hopped in my electric car and drove out there. Um, one place I did stop was at White Sands. A little bit quiet. I don't know if we can raise the volume in here a little bit. Yeah, um, if you didn't hear that, all that white sand there is actually fish poop. Um, it's parrot fish that are eating algae on coral reefs. So in the middle of New Mexico, 
it was once a huge ocean and there were coral reefs and there were enough parrotfish to be eating the algae and chewing off little bits of the calcium carbonate of the coral. And then as it got processed through their body, they left it behind in all that sand. White sand beaches of Hawaii as well, same story. Um, believe it or not, I learned this from, anyway, the owner of a duck. <sighs> yeah, <laughs> whole other story. Um, Anyway, I finally made it, made it to Texas, and everything there is bigger. Those were enormous flags, of course, at some car dealerships or, or whatever they were, um, but it was, it was there. Made it to our wonderful location. I was with the uh, Griffith Observatory Foundation trip that went to Belton, Texas to see the eclipse. We stopped off in Dallas and Fort Worth, and we said hello to everybody as they came into the hotel. It was a lot of fun to see everybody on the trip, and of course, I changed into my, uh, my cowboy hat once I made it into Texas. Uh, folks got these pictures. I'm not sure who took this. I stole a bunch off the WhatsApp that we communicated on. Thank you, everybody. Um, but didn't credit anybody, but it's, it's good. You just you'll enjoy seeing your pictures. Um, this I did take. This was at the um, the planetarium where we went, the Noble Planetarium in Fort Worth, and this is actually an exercise bike similar to the ones used on Skylab to keep the astronauts in shape. They were experimenting to be able to do exercise. If you go in space, there's no gravity pulling you down. You're not fighting against anything, so how do you stay in shape? Well, you got to ride a bike. you got to do a lot of exercise to keep your muscles strong, and this is one they actually used on the ground to practice uh, when they went up in space, but nonetheless. This Patrick and Matthew, they're not here tonight. Normally, Patrick and Matthew are are in the tech booth, or oftentimes Patrick is out here on the floor with us, but both of them were on the eclipse trip with us, and here they are in the Noble Planetarium, and again, here they are with um, our very own um, executive director of Griffith Observatory Foundation, um, Anne-Marie Betke. We'll hear a message from her later. And the gentleman on the right, I'm forgetting his name, but he gave us a, a wonderful presentation about eclipses in their little dome. It's a small dome, but it gives them capabilities and flexibility that's, that's quite nice. We really appreciated hearing from them. Um, of course, there were other exhibits in the same museum. They had cows, they had their, a lot of those. They had a, a puma, so it reminded me of P-22, of course, our very own. But the big question was that everybody had in mind is, are we going to see anything? Everybody's looking at the weather, worrying about this, and this big band of clouds going across there, and you can see, you know, uh, Dallas is in the, yeah, somewhere in there, and that, uh, not good. So we're all kind of worried about this, and meanwhile, I'm the astronomer on the trip. I'm having to keep everybody happy and think, how am I going to keep spirits up if we don't get to see an eclipse? What are we going to do? Well, luckily, the folks on the trip were already ahead of me, and they were sharing these sorts of things. <laughs> yeah, they were ahead of me already, and they were sharing this sort of stuff, saying, well, this is, our, this is what we're going to do. If we don't see the eclipse, we're going to get some Oreos. I th thought it was great. Um, but terrific things like that. Now, right now, we're going to turn to our very own observatory director, um, Dr. Edwin C. Krupp, and he's going to tell us about observing from Mexico down there. And it's about a oh, 15, 18 minute long presentation. So we'll dim the lights in here, enjoy the program, everybody, and then we'll come back live and talk some more about the other trips and the other experiences. But please enjoy this presentation. He's sorry he couldn't be here tonight, but nonetheless, very pleased that we do get to hear from him. or online to All Space Considers Roundup of the All North American Transcontinental Total Solar Eclipse of April 8th, 2024. And in particular, the Griffith Observatory, Griffith Observatory Foundation Eclipse Initiatives that turned it into an international enterprise. The US was the sole proprietor of the All American Transcontinental Total Solar Eclipse of August 21st, 2017, uh, the previous total solar eclipse in U.S. territory. This time, the eclipse was shared with Mexico and with Canada. So 10 days ago, the U.S. was devoured by darkness, but so was Canada and so was Mexico. And Griffith Observatory Foundation mobilized successful eclipse expeditions to two of those three territories, one in the U.S. to Belton, Texas, and the other to Mexico, to Mazatlan on Mexico's west coast. We just left the Canadians to fend for themselves. And in addition, Griffith Observatory Foundation financed Griffith Observatory's first total solar eclipse live stream internet broadcast, miraculously, from Little Rock, Arkansas, to the entire world, most of which was nowhere near the path of totality. Just about everyone who was on the path of the eclipse faced prospects of uncertain weather and perhaps cloudy sky at totality. 
things seemed better for Mexico and Texas, but as we approached Eclipse Day, it was clear that nothing was certain and that there were plenty of clouds for everybody uh, from Mexico to Canada. Uh, so despite that threat, each armature of the Griffith Observatory, Griffith Observatory Foundation Eclipse Mechanism, managed to pull a total eclipse out of the sky, as did many observatory employees who embarked on their own eclipse heroics. And I apologize for my absence from the lectern this evening. Once I returned to Los Angeles, I succumbed to microbes, presumably encountered on the flights home, and I am working to contain them to a single host. I was privileged to accompany Griffith Observatory Foundation's Mexico eclipse operation, and I'm grateful to the foundation for the opportunity to do so and uh, to witness my 17th total solar eclipse. Please let me as well acknowledge more particularly Griffith Observatory Foundation staff, Melanie Flavin and Lex McNaughton, who accompanied the group in Mexico and bird dogged everything, and also Alicia Burke, who kept as us anchored from uh, her post in the US. Insider Expeditions, our US tour operator, put together a trip that departed far from the ordinary with our very effective and Mexican DMC. And I especially owe a great debt. This is to all of the convivial participants for their good company and for the chance to share their eclipse experience. Now, according to ancient Aztec tradition, we live in the era of the fifth sun, and that's whose face appears here on the famous so-called Aztec calendar stone. And so it was the fifth sun that went into eclipse on April 8th. Uh, and this is how the Aztecs pretty much saw the way a solar eclipse goes down. Tonatiu, the sun, is attacked by star demons. He's there in the upper half of the picture, uh, his body uh, formed of a ray disc, yellow and red, but uh, featuring the red rays uh, pointing in multiple directions. And his arms and legs and, of course, neck and head all extend outward from there. And at each uh, joint, uh, where a sun disk marks part of his body, there are star demons attacking him and blood flowing from him uh, throughout. He is uh, obviously in, in serious trouble, and uh, those star demons are all over him. This illustration is from the Codex Borgia, which is a central Mexican ritual almanac from before the time of European contact. Later, after the conquest, Fray Bernardino de Sahagún, a Franciscan priest, collected a monumental amount of information about Aztec customs and belief, and he explained what happened when the sun is eclipsed. To quote Sahagún, the sun turned red and he became restless and troubled. He faltered and became very yellow. Then there were a tumult and disorder. All were disquieted, unnerved and frightened. There was a weeping. The common folk raised a cry, lifting their voices, making a great din, calling out and shrieking. There was shouting everywhere. People of light complexion were slain as sacrifices. Captives were killed. All offered their blood. They drew straws to the lobes of their ears, which had been pierced. And in all the temples, there was the singing of fitting chants. There was an uproar. There were war cries. It was thus said, if the eclipse of the sun is complete, it will be dark forever. The demons of darkness will come down. They will eat men. And this is just one post-conquest example of how those star demons were imagined. And in particular, they were associated with the bright planets that appear at the time or near totality in the solar eclipse. So however you look at it, solar eclipses in Mexico were problematic. And I congratulate all of the participants on the ancient pyramids and solar eclipse in the land of the fifth sun tour for submerging their eclipse fear and giving totality a go in old Mexico. The name of the tour suggests its itinerary included more than the eclipse, and, and that is so. Most of the group arrived in Mexico City on April 3rd, five days before the eclipse, for an intense schedule of remarkable antiquities. And we started the first day by driving to Iztapalapa, a far southern suburb of Mexico City, and the location of Cerro de la Estrella, the Hill of the Star. 
This is the place where the Aztecs performed the binding of the years ceremony when every 52 years the cosmos might end. They watched to see if the Pleiades, that familiar star cluster, continued to pass overhead at midnight. And if it did, they performed a sacrifice on the summit, carried the new fire down to the entire city, and judged that they had another 52-year lease on life, uh, the universe, and everything. While temple foundations may still be seen on Cerro de la Estrella, it is one of the most important sites of the entire Aztec world, but practically no one goes there except Griffith Observatory Foundation. We also went to Temple Mayor, the central sacred precinct of Tenochtitlan, the Aztec capital, and in fact, the entire Aztec empire. Its mythology and its architecture include important astronomical elements, including the massive carved relief of Coil Shauki, who has lunar associations and is shown dismembered, her body dismembered in analogy with the waning moon and its partition. Mexico City is also the home of the, one of the world's greatest archeological museums, the National Museum of Anthropology. And many of the objects on display have celestial connotations, not the least of which uh, is the celebrated Aztec calendar stone, which was not actually a calendar and was never hung up on a wall. And for more about that, stay tuned for the fall, this fall, and the opening of Pacific Standard Universe, the Griffith Observatory, Griffith Observatory Foundation contribution to the Getty Foundation's massive Pacific Standard Time Art and Science Collide Southern California Arts Initiative. We also went out to Teotihuacan, the great urban center that had emerged practically 2,000 years ago and then faded and fallen to ruin at least half a millennium before the Aztecs began getting their act together in central Mexico. Teotihuacan is a standard and obligatory stop for anyone interested in Mexico's ancient past, but the Griffith Observatory Foundation explorers went beyond the obvious with special access provided by Mexican archeologist Sergio Gomez to the ancient tunnel and shrine he discovered beneath the pyramid of the feathered serpent. The tunnel is about 40 feet below the surface of the ground, and it ends after 330 feet at a point directly below the pyramid center. Gomez found thousands of offerings and artifacts, and he argues that the entire installation is a model of the universe, a model of cosmic order. Well, all during the five days of touring, I continued to check Mazatlan's weather, which wasn't good mostly cloudy prevailed, but as we got closer to eclipse day, the cloudiness evolved slightly for the better to partly cloudy. I finally realized I should check on the projected transparency of those clouds and realized the circumstances were better than I'd feared. Mazatlan's cloud transparency was a steady 11 to 12 percent, and totality likely would be visible through 30 percent. So with lighter hearts and Gone from uh, Teotihuacan, we all took the restricted elevators to the roof at the 19th floor of the Viaggio Hotel in Mazatlan, where we were all staying at about 9 a.m. local time. And except for the owner of the hotel and his family, uh, which with whom I, I, I really, of course, have no quarrel, we had exclusive access to the expansive roof, an ideal eclipse viewing platform with plenty of elevated room and the elevation proved to be unexpectedly interesting. Well, despite the clouds, we picked off first contact on schedule at 9.51 a.m. local time. This is Jeff Ziegler's picture of first, uh, first little bite out of the sun. And the sun already elevated at 54 degrees was hard to target with my high magnification lens. In time, I had to abandon high magnification photography, but others who were better equipped and more deft obtained lovely images, which I'll show in a bit. Clouds stayed with us, uh, but so did the eclipse sun, and the drama unfolded. Uh, photographs taken by many members of the group show how it all played out. Uh, the folks up on the roof with a variety of uh, cameras or uh, no cameras at all, just depending on how they wanted to uh, make the eclipse uh, 
uh, an experience uh, personalized. Uh, here, a number of members of the group uh, followed my advice to put on an eye patch of one sort or another to enhance the sensitivity of one of the eyes. Uh, the idea being that you take off the eye patch uh, after second contact uh, arrives with totality and then uh, obtain an image with one more sensitive eye to see if you can discern more detail in the sun's corona. Uh, just an added word on that score. Uh, the cloud cover that we did experience washed out many of those fainter details. And as a consequence, uh, although many had the eye patch, it made no difference whatsoever. Uh, people, of course, were intent on uh, keeping track of the progress of the, uh, the moon across the face of the sun and using a variety of techniques to do so, not only direct observation through safe filters, but also uh, pinhole projection through a straw hat, uh, or um, uh, just a, a, a mini uh, tea caddy uh, with a lot of little crescents produced or uh, reflection uh, with a flat mirror on a very white wall. Uh, the things, of course, really began to accelerate as we approached totality at 11.07.31 a.m. Uh, in this sequence of photographs by Grady Smith, the sun just shrinks down farther and farther until it hits that diamond ring uh, the last little bit gleaming of the chromosphere, and then we have a uh, total eclipse. Uh, you can see from the picture that we get the inner corona and, of course, uh, quite a number of bright prominences, but the outer corona, again, was elusive, and that is because of the uh, diminished transparency of, of the cloud cover. The eclipse showed through quite beautifully, but those fainter effects uh, just wash away uh, when you don't have a, a clear sky. Uh, but uh, nonetheless, uh, the eclipse was gorgeous, either photographically or, of course, to the unaided eye just on the rooftop, until four minutes and 17 seconds later when the second diamond ring arrives and the uh, totality shuts down. Uh, Jeff Ziegler was able to get hints of the outer corona uh, with his exposures. You can begin just to discern how uh, that might have played out had we had a, a slightly uh, more transparent sky. And uh, Shelley Smith took this picture with low magnification of the eclipse sun, and the looks like the diamond ring or close to it, uh, but it reveals the aureole of light around the sun that was produced by the cloud layer. And even Venus uh, to the lower right showed up in her, her shot. Um, as time went on, I switched to uh, lower magnification uh, photography, wide angle view uh, of the, um, the eclipse sun, of course, with Venus to its upper right. Uh, but Jupiter, uh, again, for us, was lost in the clouds. A few people said they, they caught it briefly, but for all practical purposes, it remained hidden. Uh, and then uh, just a smaller magnification view of totality. Uh, and, of course, a wraparound sunset uh, that uh, encircled the horizon uh, with mostly yellow and a sort of greenish pallor up, uh, up above it, uh, but all uh, uh, very... Um, uh, un, unexpectedly unworldly from the rooftop like that. Uh, the um, uh, the cloud kept us seeing, as I said, the outer corona, but it was captured at least almost uh, photographically. The catastrophically deep black of the moon's near side was also diluted by the clouds. It was black, but not as black as sometimes seen. Uh, needless to say, we had no prayer of seeing Comet Pons Brooks, which was up there, uh, with the sun and, and the planets. We could see uh, at least one major prominence on the right side of the sun with the unaided eye, and uh, more, of course, in binoculars. Uh, Venus was easy to spot, but as I said, Jupiter was elusive. Some said they saw it. And from our elevated location, it would have been possible to see the moon's shadow racing toward us out of the Gulf of California. I'm not sure anyone actually did see it, but Gil Michaeli did capture it in time lapse on his iPhone. Uh, the wraparound sunset was color consistent, <clears throat> that sort of yellowish um, hue in, in every direction. And during the eclipse, the temperature dropped uh, 10 degrees Fahrenheit from 70 degrees to 60 degrees Fahrenheit. The entire story of the all North American transcontinental total solar eclipse of April 8th, 2024, will appear in an upcoming issue of the Griffith Observer, perhaps August or September. 
And if you are a member of the foundation or a subscriber, you'll get it. If not, you'll have to advance your status. For now, I'll conclude this brief report with an element of my personal experience with this eclipse. I try at each total solar eclipse to identify something preeminently distinctive and memorable about it. And for this one eclipse, the lofty perch on the Viaggio rooftop was essential. From the roof, we could look out over the city of Mazatlan and on the beach side of the hotel, we could see the crowd filling in more and more into the narrow margin of sand between the hotels and the waves as the eclipse progressed toward totality. While the tension and the excitement on the rooftop were entirely predictable, far below the roof, far off in both directions on the shore and far off over the city, we could hear a low rumble of cheering and bursting exuberance, muffled by distance but unmistakable. We heard an entire city responding at low frequency to the eclipse. It sounded like an uncanny murmur of uncountable voices that rose up the walls of the hotel and reached us on the roof to let us know the eclipse did its job in Mazatlan. Thanks so much, David, and thank you all at All Space Considered, and thanks to Griffith Observatory Foundation and the Griffith Observatory teams for taking this eclipse and bringing it back home. Uh, really terrific report from uh, Mazatlan. Um, well, now it's time to uh, get back to Texas. So I'll put on my hat briefly. <laughs> I also broke out my Eclipse shirt. We had shirts made for our trip. In fact, I'm seeing some in the audience. So, no, I'm not going to keep the hat on because I'll just be a dark shadow down there. But we did make it to Texas, to Summers Mill Retreat and Conference Center. It was an amazing place for the folks that were going to Belton to hang out. Um, we had, well, a nice conference center to have talks and things. Um, some of these were shared with the WhatsApp. So, sorry, they look a little blurry up there at the moment. They look better down here. I don't know what's going on. <laughs> anyway, um, but you can see here we had a beautiful place to have uh, food while we were there. We had lots of great meals. You don't want to hear that. You want to hear about the eclipse, of course. We had a beautiful field to set up on. It was absolutely gorgeous to be out there and be spread out and have all our things. Um, nobody was crowded. People could be around others and enjoy the eclipse. We had equipment that we had set up. Of course, we also had vegetable steamers making little <laughs> eclipsed versions of the sun there. Um, of course, you know, this a lot of people have seen. Um, I'm forgetting who made this, but it was one of our trip goers, and it's been shared by all of us, and those are little eclipse suns right there. Um, I set up a projection scope I created for the trip, and it worked remarkably well, actually. We did get about a four or four and a half inch image of the sun. There I am showing it off, explaining what's going on. I'm actually probably trying to solve a light leak that I had. And, uh, you know, not a bad little image. There is a sunspot in there. Let's see if we can see it. Maybe, maybe not. Anyway, the, the moon was definitely crossing it. And there is the sunspot in right there. It was about the size of the Earth. And those are clouds crossing the image, of course. We, we had clouds, but we did see the partial phase. We were very excited. The crowd, our crowd would cheer, and then it would go away. Oh, no. And we'd cheer again. Yay, it's back. And oh, no. So it was just so dramatic. We had no idea what we were going to see. Uh, we just kept wondering. People did try out their filters, shots through glasses, shots through filters that we made. But some folks were missing. We were supposed to have our astronomical observer, Vanessa Alicon, with us, Patrick So, Matthew Berlando, our streaming gear. I didn't show you any pictures of that. So where was all of that? Well, Vanessa's going to come up here and tell you about the adventure that she had uh, with our streaming crew. So yes, take it away, Vanessa. I can tell you a little bit about what happened. Yeah, so, welcome, hello. All right, so... Um, we had a long path to totality. Um, so uh, right here. So this is kind of like a summary of everything that happened. So uh, to start off with, we did do a lot of practicing here at the observatory. Uh, so get that right there. Uh, this is in our planetarium. Uh, so as in, you know, 
Griffith Observatory tradition, we did practice uh, in our planetarium. A lot of other people were trained in there, if you don't know the history. Uh, but it wasn't great for tracking or anything like that. The, the tr it was actually the wrong angle. But what it was very helpful for was the timing. So we set up the timing for Belton, Texas. We were very ready to go to Texas to stream this eclipse. Uh, we bought all our equipment and, uh, you know, you could see the image right there. It's fake, but it felt, you know, real enough for the moment uh, for practice. Um, and we even took some of our equipment out on the, in the field. So we went to the Autry, took a little car trip out there to try to set up things away from the observatory, see if the internet was going to be working the way we wanted it to. And this is Matthew directing us to, you know, get to the next uh, spot. And all of our equipment was working great. We were ready, ready for Belton, Texas. Um, and this is a... Um, a screenshot of the live image that we even we even streamed it live like just for ourselves just to see make sure everything was working a nice image of the sun with our telescope which is actually just a camera with a very large lens um, and here is Matthew and Patrick uh, also another screenshot that is the live image that we had from up there so we did a lot of preparation for uh, Belton Texas <laughs> um, so we I went out, uh, I was going to arrive a little bit later than everybody else, so uh, I was driving out there myself. So me and my crew, I had some of my friends uh, come up, and we drove to uh, the Grand Canyon, and we spent the first night there, which was great. It was a lot of fun. Um, the next morning, we tried to see the Grand Canyon, but it was a little snowy. <laughs> uh, so that actually got me thinking about the weather. So... Um, we were already kind of nervous because when we first uh, set out to leave, there was a lot of talk about rain. I was checking the weather apps constantly, and they said it was going to be raining in Belton, Texas. Uh, so I kept very close tabs. I joined a group uh, that uh, some of our museum guides made. Uh, Laura May made the group, and I think a lot of uh, we had a, few, a lot of people in the group uh, kind of checking up on weather, see where we all were. It felt really collaborative and it was really nice to actually feel like all of those people were with us uh, on our journey. Even though we were all in completely different locations, uh, we could check in with the weather and kind of commiserate. Um, so as you can see here, this is the first day. It, Belton doesn't look too bad from here. Uh, it's actually kind of clear uh, in a large section in the center that's, that's clear. But uh, my other weather apps were still saying kind of negative things. So I checked in with uh, Jennifer and Pixie that day because they were going to be in uh, Arkansas and I knew that. Um, and just to see what they were thinking about the weather, just kind of like to get the idea going, uh, just in case. Uh, but it still looks okay here, so I wasn't making any decisions yet. Um, so we kept going on our way. We went to Albuquerque, uh, New Mexico. Uh, everything was kind of a blur because every time we went to a new location, I would just kind of like whenever we were camping, go into my sleeping bag and check the weather apps constantly. Uh, so I was looking at a bunch of different models to make sure that, you know, we were going to get to see this eclipse. Uh, this would be my second eclipse, by the way. So the first one I saw in 2017 uh, kind of made me really interested in seeing another one. And I felt like I had a lot to lose in this one if I didn't see it. So uh, the second one feels like a lot of pressure for me for some reason. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if that's true, but you know, that's how it felt. Uh, so on th this day, this was April uh, 5th, um, I checked the weather apps again, and it was looking worse. Uh, so tension was building. I was getting really nervous. Uh, I started texting uh, uh, Patrick. I let him know, hey, what's the plan if it does rain in, in Texas? Like, what are we going to do? Uh, we were at the time thinking, oh, we'll we at least show the, the light dimming. It's a lot different. It, uh, it's still an experience for sure. Um, so spent the whole day looking at that. Um, and this one here is my favorite satellite image. This was on April 6th, but look at that line of clouds. I thought, I thought that I was looking at another totality path, but that's actually just the clouds. Perfect. Lined up just right for us to no one in the path of totality to see the eclipse. Uh, but this was still the day before, so it wasn't a prediction. It was just what the weather looked like that day. I just thought it was fun. Um, so we kept going, and we were going as, you know, just to Belton, Texas. We were going to touch base with them no matter what uh, to make sure that, you know, we're all on the same page. Uh, but at this point, I was pretty sure that this was not going to be uh, the place to do the streaming. And that's not to say that uh, the stream wouldn't have been successful if it was dim. It would have gotten the dimming, but, uh, and, you know, people at the... Um, 
at in Belton, Texas would have gotten a very great experience still because they're in the environment watching all of this happen live and in person. So the experience would be very different for people online that maybe just seeing the landscape dimming. It wouldn't quite be hit the same, I think. Uh, so kept checking the weather apps, making myself more sure that this is probably not a uh, the best place to be. So uh, in the morning, uh, Patrick actually sent me a text saying that, you know, there's a place in north of Dallas that may be able to see the eclipse. So I thought that sounds good, but what if we went further? But I didn't say anything yet because I was still thinking about it. Watching the weather apps is still a couple of days ahead. So, uh, or one day ahead at least. So uh, we finally uh, got to Belton, Texas, and uh, I had a conversation with Patrick. We got there, and, and uh, we he brought up the Dallas idea, and I said, what if we went further? <laughs> what if we took a little trip, seven-hour drive, uh, to Little Rock, Arkansas? Um, and uh, he was... Curious, well, would we be able to do that? Would, like, are you willing to, to go out that far? And I was like, absolutely. My crew is ready to make the drive. Uh, we can, you know, we will take the wheel, and you can sit in the back, and and it'll be a little bit difficult with uh, finding a place to sleep uh, because we hadn't ha planned that out. But I had already texted Pixie and Jennifer, and we were talking about, oh, well, worst case scenario, we can sleep in the car and on the floor <laughs> um, because I really felt like we needed to get that clear image. Uh, in uh, Arkansas, because um, I, we, when we got to, to, to Belton, uh, I did have a conversation with David. David said, oh, I think we might be able to see it, some high clouds. But, but even then, I felt for the stream, it's, it, it's different. So like I said, uh, the, the high clouds would um, kind of, as Dr. Krupp said, uh, dilute the corona a bit, which as somebody watching the stream, you might need you, you really want the full experience. So that's, I was trying to get us to a place that would be the best odds for actually seeing this eclipse in its totality. Uh, so uh, we did end up going to Little Rock, Arkansas. <laughs> so we left at uh, 9.30 p.m. and we arrived at 4.30 a.m. Uh, but and thank, thankfully, uh, Anne Marie, the director of the foundation, the Griffith Observatory Foundation, was very generous and uh, was able to actually be flexible with us and provided us uh, a place to sleep. So we called up the uh, hotel that uh, Pixie and Jennifer were staying at, and they actually still had places open, which was amazing. Uh, and uh, we were actually able to get in. I don't know, like three hours of sleep. For me, it was three hours. Patrick, I think, got a little bit less because he was uh, changing the slides from Belton to uh, Little Rock. So all of the times were set up for Belton, Texas. So thank you, Patrick, for doing that. Uh, we really appreciate it. Um, but yeah, we did get going. And uh, on the way there, I took this picture. It's a terrible picture, actually. But I feel like it kind of captured what it felt like to be in the car a little bit, driving for hours. This is like a couple hours in. Uh, uh, my, friend's, uh, uh, my friend Cole is driving there, and, and Matt also drove. So uh, shout out to them for actually getting us to the eclipse. <laughs> uh, they're not part of the observatory, but they did uh, perform a very vital role. <laughs> uh, so... Yeah, so we ended up uh, kind of brainstorming where are we actually going to set up this stream? Because in Belton, Texas, we had that big open field that was ready for us to set up and, and watch the eclipse, but we had a, kind of an unknown going out into Arkansas. Uh, I had seen a bunch of places along the way that were open lots and saying, like, oh, you can rent out this place for a fee, uh, and you know you get some space to view the eclipse. So worst case scenario, that was one of our options on the way up. Uh, but I did a little Google search and found a really pretty park uh, that was a good potential spot, and it was called Mamel Park, uh, right on the banks or next to the banks of the Arkansas River. Uh, we had a couple of other options as well that were uh, maybe not as pretty, but would have been very functional, uh, but this one ended up working out. Uh, online, they said that they were in the path of totality, so I figured if they're advertising it, then they must be okay with us being there, and they definitely were, uh, and it was a beautiful park. We had our choice of which little awning to sit underneath. 
there was hardly anybody there. It was really amazing. It, I was very shocked that it was just so easy to find a spot. Uh, we we got we were very fortunate in that. And um, I we as you can see, there's like some high clouds up there, but generally blue skies. And I think it ended up working out really well. Uh, we set up all of our equipment. Uh, we have birds ready and like a nice ready to put on a show. Hopefully, you know, that's what we were hoping at least. Um, and we have our whole crew setting up all of our equipment um, with a nice umbrella to keep us, because it was warm. It was about 80 degrees that day, so uh, very, very warm for us. And uh, we were all set up and ready for the moon and the sun to do what they do. Thanks, Pixie, for that picture. It's very yeah. cute. <laughs> so. Now the, the drama is completely ready. Um, Vanessa has relocated the streaming crew to a, a better place to, to view, and amazing decision that was. Well, back in Belton, we were getting images of the partially eclipsed sun. Now, did the eclipse happen? Well, here's a hint. Yes, it did. It got dark. Did we see anything in Belton, though? Were those clouds too thick for us to see anything? And the answer is no. We actually saw the eclipse. It was amazing. There were more clouds. This was, would not have been as good of an experience for our streaming crew. But for us, it kind of didn't matter. The thing looked huge in the sky to my eyes. Um, here's a little, here's a short little video. And you can see how quickly those clouds drifted past, which were cool. Um, that bright red prominence you can make out. Now, these photos, you might be saying, why is he showing these? These don't look as spectacular as you know, some of the professional photos that are taken. Well, these are individuals that were on our trip that took these pictures. And it doesn't matter how good your picture is. It's about making the memories and about remembering that you were there. So these are shots that folks got along the trip. And these are the, the memories that were made by, by everyone that went on the trip with us. So some really great photos. We had a little uh, filter making uh, craft project we did before, so some of the partial pictures were taken through those. But a lot of people got photos with their cell phones, with cameras, and with other gear, and really captured the event. Now, right after totality, um, this is a little video someone captured, and you can just see how happy we all were. <laughs> So we were all pretty blown away by that. It was a pretty amazing experience. Um, but a lot of folks All I from the observer. We had more drama. Well, I thought so. Um, well, we probably did because there were times we thought we would see nothing. Yeah. I was really worried I'd have to learn how to juggle, find some clown makeup. I don't know. Uh, Mark Piner, our deputy director here, was supporting those decisions. Um, but we didn't need it. It ended up we were able to have a great time. Now, a lot of observatory employees did travel to other locations. Folks were all along the path of totality. And I thought, well, I can't invite everybody here tonight to get their reports. So we put together a little video. And I hope you'll enjoy this. Some of this does tell you, should you go? Should you go see one of these eclipses sometime? Um, enjoy this little video. I'm going to dim the lights again. And we'll go to, uh, I'll be right back in about six minutes or so. If you're on the fence about going to see an eclipse, get a chainsaw and rip up and tear down the fence because you need to go see it. Stop, stop, just go. Do everything you can to go see an eclipse. I flew to Cleveland, Ohio, which is where my mom has lived for 35 years. I watched the total solar eclipse from the delightful little town of Sulphur Springs, Texas. I traveled to Little Rock, Arkansas, all the way from Los Angeles, California. I saw the total eclipse in Belton, Texas on Griffith Observatory Foundation's eclipse trip. Uh, so we ended up traveling about 2,000 miles. Uh, we made it to Mountain View, Arkansas, a little valley uh, just east of the Ozark National Forest. I observed in Poplar Bluff, Missouri, my eight inch Newtonian telescope, which I've used for several eclipses before. Camera on a tripod, a 400 millimeter lens. Then for totality, I have a 100 to 400 millimeter lens on a DSLR. Through the eight inch telescope, the sunspots were easily visible. Uh, they were either as large or larger than planet Earth. All the moths. <gasps> Oh my 
God, Jacob, put it down. Put it down. Put it down. <gasps> We're not in full eclipse yet, are we? Two minutes. <laughs> oh my God, the diamond ring. Don't look at the side. Don't look at the side. Wow. Wow. <laughs> it looks like a sunset. <laughs> There's the diamond ring. You're good. There it is. There it is. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Woo! 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 Experiencing a total solar eclipse is a fully out-of-body experience. All of my friends said, now we understand what you were talking about when you got back from 2017. It does feel like I can't stop seeing them now. I have seen two total solar eclipses and one annular. Everything happens that is totally counterintuitive to what you're used to seeing all your life. The sun is out, maybe a cloud will cover it up, but you're not used to seeing this large thing in space cover up the sun and, uh, and allow you to see the outer atmosphere of the sun, the corona. It's, it's, uh, it's a peak experience of your life. You will never uh, forget it. I will travel as far as I can afford and am physically able to for the rest of my life to try and catch as many of these events as I can uh, for the rest of my days. As soon as I saw the, the diamond ring effect, I burst into tears and could hardly handle it. Uh, at one point, my fiance remembers noticing me on the ground staring at the grass because it, it, like, it was just far too much for my brain to comprehend for a moment. Seeing how the how the universe almost lines up almost in perfect unison to create a solar eclipse um, really gets down to something truly prime or tr something truly deep in your soul that really changes you forever. I like to say that the first solar eclipse that I had ever seen felt like the closest thing to a religious experience I've ever had. I didn't realize how much emotion I would also feel during this, and I started crying as well. I was deeply moved. It was just a really, really beautiful sight. It, it just feels like a really special, magical moment. Um, you know, I ended up being there with coworkers, and it really felt like such a bonding experience um, to be able to experience that with them. If you have not seen a total solar eclipse yet, definitely make a point of it. You have to. You have to see a total solar eclipse. So now very quickly, I'm just going to show you some images that were gathered. That giant prominence there, that's probably the size of Jupiter, I'm guessing, give or take. Uh, give or take an Earth or two. <laughs> um, you know, it's it just incredible. This one actually kind of shows the Bailey's beads a little bit too, and another big prominence. It's it, it just spectacular, amazing. By the way, a lot of those images that were in that movie, and you also saw Anthony Perkick, were taken by Anthony. He's one of our telescope demonstrators. Huge skills, so um, I greatly appreciate the work he put into the imagery. Yes, awesome work.
Um, here's another shot he took a little bit later, and I'll just inch towards totality here, three minutes before, two minutes before, and boom, you get that you know diamond ring effect, really just gorgeous. And we're even seeing some prominences on that other side of the sun where we didn't see them, so they were all around the sun. We're actually at solar maximum very close to now, within the next year or so, and that means there's lots of activity. So great eclipse for that. Um, here he captured the corona a little further out than a lot of folks did because, again, he headed for clear skies. Um, again, final diamond ring effect here with the, uh, that prominence in the southern part of the sun. And, of course, our opening image tonight was this gorgeous one taken here. And um, it is just beautiful. It's, it's a wonderful scene. Now, what happened with our stream? Vanessa, come back up here. And um, she's going to finish up her tale of how the stream went and what they, they did. So uh, in case any of you did not see the stream, uh, we did see totality. Woo! Yes. Uh, so I was able to get more of the corona here. You can see it stretches out pretty far, uh, even though there were some high wispy clouds. We did get a lot, a good amount of detail, I think. Uh, and then Pixie uh, took a great picture of the inner part where you can see those prominences also really well and the nice diamond ring. Uh, excellent picture. Um, yeah, and uh, kind of... Let's go back to the people that I actually brought along this trip, um, and uh, Patrick and and Matthew. Uh, so they are not here, so they didn't get to really say that much about it. And I, um, I feel like I missed so many things that they would I know have said. Um, but uh, I did catch a little video about uh, after right after the eclipse or close to it uh, of the people that I brought along and uh, Patrick and Matthew, and then a little bit of uh, the eclipse itself. So uh, here we go. We are on the way back to Texas. Let's go. The, the eclipse was amazing. Uh, it was so cool. Uh, really happy we saw it. It lasted a good while. And I was happy to see the geese flying through. It was really cool. Really cool. So thank you. And I am happy to have experienced it with you guys. With fr friendship is always uh, makes it more valuable. All right. Hello. But feeling, I'm feeling pretty good. I'm, I'm feeling enlightened because <laughs> when are you ever going to experience a natural phenomena like this with the people that you love around you? Okay, you know, it's, it's not gonna. It's, it's a once in a lifetime opportunity, and it's also a thing that's off my bucket list now. Like, there's, this is such a beautiful moment. And I love and appreciate all of you. Super cool. Super glad we got to do this. Um, yeah, no, it's really never seen it ever before. Like movies and pictures cannot do it justice so Facts. mega mega um like satisfied that we got to just yeah just experience this all together oh it was a blast um the problem i had was that i was looking at my screen and then i realized i should stop looking at my screen and actually look at the eclipse and so i turned around and it was way better than the last one i saw so that's kind of cool <laughs> i've already been on camera <laughs> um Vanessa, thank you, uh, first of all, for convincing me uh, to uh, go to um, Little Rock. That's okay. Um, the rest of it then. Uh, so. Uh, we did see totality, and you can see here, uh, this is right after the <laughs> uh, eclipse. I went immediately to the GOES West, or GOES uh, satellite imagery and downloaded that. Um, but you can also see right after, there's a bunch of clouds that came in uh, right around Texas and Arkansas. Uh, so on the way back, we actually dealt with a lot of rain, which I'm sure some of you also had to deal with if you went out there. Um, so it was a lot. Um, and uh, thank you to my friends again for driving Kevin this time and uh, and Cole. Uh, I was very nervous the whole time uh, because it was really coming down hard. So I, we pulled over for a little bit and um, it was uh, almost bad enough that we couldn't really see as we were driving. So we had to stop. <laughs> But it was pretty, pretty intense. Um, so we drove again for another seven hours, uh, but we were feeling much better because we had just experienced a total solar eclipse. Uh, and we uh, were very grateful to uh, reach our beds <laughs> uh, in Belton, Texas. <laughs> 
so thank you again to the foundation for um, providing us a, a place to be for most of this. <laughs> um, so after that, we went on the road again and made our way all the way back here. Um, and for a total of uh, 4,193 miles driven, 66 hours of driving time. Uh, so we were all just a little bit tired, but um, it worked out just in case you didn't see it. Like really look at it. That was <laughs> slow driving. Um, but yeah, that's uh, pretty much our journey. <laughs> yeah, it was anyway a great decision um, by Vanessa, and I think she downplayed her role just a little bit. So um, I'm not sure our streaming crew would have relocated without her having those heart-to-heart -heart talks with the other folks and saying, look, we need to go. So again, round of applause for Vanessa for making that great decision. Um, and for the foundation for supporting it and all the rest, of course. But still, it takes sometimes it takes that one person to say, look, we're going to do this. And Vanessa was that person. Um, there were some other amazing shots taken. You can find them online. I, okay, I'm not going to say I stole these, but anyway. Um, in, in our nation's capital, they, they had a partial eclipse. Somebody aligned all of this, planned it, took all the, all the photos. Great job. Um, from the uh, summit of Saddleback Mountain along the Appalachian Trail, folks enjoying the eclipse, there was a baseball game. And though this is not a night game, this was a day game, and the lights came on, and this was before the game, of course, but they watching the eclipse. Uh, Niagara Falls, saw totality, so another cool spot. This here, uh, they're having a great time. I'm not sure what stadium they're in, but does anybody see the order there? The earth, sun, moon. Um, there's a lunar eclipse, the solar eclipse, and then the apocalypse. This is an apocalypse. Um, one of our, our trip attendees uh, posted this, but they also added in apocalypse. <laughs> so um, maybe that's better for a, a Central or South American trip, perhaps. Um, shots like this were common. You could find them all over the place. This is from Mexico. So again, a beautiful shot there. Um, right now, I want to invite up um, Griffith Observatory Foundation board member, Tricia Nelson. She was on the trip with us to Belton, but I want to have her tell her experiences a little bit. So she's an umbrophile, a certified one. So come on up, Tricia. A big round of applause for Tricia. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. So we've reached the confessional part of the program. My name is Trisha Nelson, and I am an umbrophile, an eclipse chaser. This was my third dance with totality, and it lived up to everything. The third one is a charm, Vanessa. Um, the thing that you learn, because it was not my first rodeo, um, is that it's a fleeting experience. So I didn't futz with my phone. I just looked up at the sky and did not miss any of those three plus minutes. Because once it's over, it's over. And other people have hinted at this. Um, the eclipse, you've heard the science, you see what the science it is. But there's something really emotional that happens. Um, it's something, it's, it's like nature just naturing. Uh, human beings have no part of this. We can just sit back and experience it. And that's what we do. And it, we realize that we're part of this amazing ecosystem, that it's not just us that we're experiencing with the animals and the bugs, and, and we see everything around us kind of change um, in this brief moment. So um, for me, that, that's a part of it, just evangelizing. I want to see more people that look like me get really into this, because I'm a left brain person. I'm not a scientist, and, and this is my jam now. This is what I want to do. I've experienced it. It makes me feel more human. It makes me feel more connected to other human beings and a part, being a part of this universe. So I'll say um, my first eclipse was in 2017. Just, I don't know how many years ago that was. Um, and for anyone who knows about eclipse chasing, you know that you know the planning, most people have planned two years in advance. Um, if you're a slacker, maybe a year in advance. I'm one of those people who will, I've got FOMO, I've got fear of missing out. 
So I didn't know about this thing. I didn't know eclipse chasing was a thing. You know, you come up to the observatory and you see a lunar, you see a supermoon, you see really cool things and you say, wow, it's fun to do that. But you don't know. It's next level when you're chasing an eclipse. So um, I said, I want to do it. How do I do it? Um, for me, it was two weeks before the 2017 eclipse. I locked on to a trip. And uh, I went to Portland with a group. I went by myself. And I got to know some very lovely people. And I will show you this. Um, we, this is before totality. We were on a very lovely tulip um, garden, tulip, what the word? Farm, farm. We're on a tulip farm. And uh, this is before totality, like I said. And if I could say something to that woman right there, I would say, girl, your life about to change. <laughs> because you see, you know, I'm enjoying some fun. I'm doing it for the gram. Um, and then you're looking at the sun, and you see it, uh, the, the eclipse happening. And there comes a time when someone, I don't know who, someone says you can take off your glasses. And you take off your glasses, and you look directly at the black hole where the sun was. And angels start singing. And everything just starts to make sense in the world. And you kind of think, like, should I? Where's my phone? How? You can't capture it. It's a multi-sensory thing. You, you, we, Vanessa and team did an amazing job bringing it to you. But that's not it. It's the way your skin feels when, when the temperature drops. It's the bugs that you hear. It's the birds. It's looking around and seeing the sunlight. It's seeing the illuminated Mount Hood in the distance, even though everything else is dark. And it's that diamond ring starting to happen when they're like, well, get ready, it's over. And I was like, no, no. So that's when an eclipse chaser was born. Because two minutes is never enough. It's not enough. You feel so many feelings. And uh, you, want to, you want to think about it. You don't want to think about your phone or how am I going to talk about this? Because it's impossible to really explain to people how it is. So I got home. I was changed. I told everybody I love, you need to do this. I told everybody who I know or who I just met, I just kept talking. You have to do it. You have to see an eclipse. And luckily for me, I was a longtime member of the organization formerly known as Friends of the Observatory. I was a member. Um, the observatory sponsored a trip in 2019, and I was able to convince friends to come along. And we spent the day of totality on a beach in Chile, and it was life-changing, different from the first one. The birds, the beach, the water, everything was just gorgeous. And I think they started to understand what I was talking about. Um, so, I was able, for this trip, I was so pleased that I had friends to go on the Mexico trip, and here they are, enjoying their time with Dr. Krupp. And of course, I was in Belton, Texas, and I convinced another friend to come along. Thank you for the photo, Dr. Reitzel. And uh, I was very concerned. Oh, well, what, what did you think? Um, and I think it delivered. I think people finally understand what I'm talking about. So uh, I believe in our mission. I am passionate about public astronomy, bringing it to the masses. And that's why I am now a member of the foundation. A few short years after uh, getting exposed to what they do on another level through the trip to Chile. And I'm going to keep evangelizing um, because I think everyone needs to see an eclipse. And you don't have to take it from me because there are writers and thinkers who've written about their personal experiences with eclipses, from Annie Dillard to Virginia Woolf to the author um, David Barron, who's got an amazing TED Talk called You Owe It to Yourself in Your Lifetime to See a Full Solar Eclipse. Um, and they explain it, I think, in better ways than I do. But what I do want to say is that I am making it my mission to tell everyone. I want everyone of all ages, 
all nationalities, all abilities. Um, the thing about an eclipse is it's accessible to many people. It's not a once in a lifetime thing. And we just have to sit back, find the place on the earth when it's happening and just look up, just look up. Forget about your phone. We can't rewind it. We can't fast forward it. We can't pause it. It's those minutes and you have to take advantage of it. So my hope for all of you, for everyone, is that you get to experience that awe because it is amazing and it makes you feel more human. It makes you feel more connected, um, a better part of the universe. And I think that's great for everyone. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, uh, absolutely true. I'm, well, that was, this was my second eclipse. The first one I saw again, I thought, I need to see another. That wasn't enough. We, we need more. And as you see, they do, they crisscross. There are some coming. Um, this one's interesting. I think it starts over there in Russia and circles around the Arctic Circle, crosses Greenland. That's where greatest eclipse is, near Greenland, Iceland, and then crosses Spain. This eclipse isn't very long, though. It's only a couple of minutes long. And in Spain, it'll be even shorter. But still, you know, if you have paella and sangria, maybe you don't care. Um, so I don't but Iceland might be a good spot, but it doesn't really cross Iceland. You need to be, need to be on a ship, so I don't know. This one, however, look, um, it looks like it crosses the Rock of Gibraltar, um, northern Africa, and then Egypt, greatest eclipse, greatest duration, is near Luxor. So just anyway, um, this is a six and a half minute long eclipse. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I say too. So anyway, whoever's listening, um, feel free to think about inviting me. I'll, I'll go. Um, uh, finally, I want to thank Griffith Observatory Foundation again for how wonderful these trips were, putting them together, giving people an opportunity to go on these trips. Again, it was a bonding experience for the people on the trips, a great opportunity for us to stream. They allowed us to do that, to bring the world, the, the stream. But um, the foundation does so much more. And I have an opportunity here to play a little video clip, just a couple of minutes long, from Executive Director Anne-Marie Betke of Griffith Observatory Foundation. I am Anne-Marie Betke, Executive Director of Griffith Observatory Foundation. I have now had two total solar eclipse experiences once in Chile in 2019, and most recently uh, in Texas with our travelers. Both were opportunities through the foundation's travel program. As Griffith Observatory's exclusive nonprofit partner, everything we do at the foundation is in support of Griffith Observatory, furthering its mission of inspiring everyone to observe, ponder, and understand the sky. When we say everyone, we mean everyone. Broadcasts such as this one and the total solar eclipse live stream from Little Rock, Arkansas are free, streamed live for everyone around the world to see. As we continue to grow our audiences, we need your support to help us scale and further this mission of free public astronomy and service. If this is exciting to you, Griffith Observatory Foundation is your avenue for getting involved and having an impact. The foundation's support base constitutes a network of people who envision a world that is informed and inspired by science. You can join us just by taking simple actions, like making a donation that is meaningful to you, becoming a volunteer, becoming a member, or simply signing up for our newsletter. It's free and we'll deliver information about space and sky, all from Griffith Observatory. You can sign up at obs.la forward slash sign up. Thank you so much, everyone, for your support along this journey. Thank you to the All Space team for having me this evening. And everyone, please continue to look up. Thanks, thank you, Anne-Marie. Um, it's a great message from Anne-Marie. Our foundation is more than just a club that likes astronomy. They aren't just folks that think, well, let's get together and go on trips together. No, they fund important work. Our school programs that reach you know, 25, 26,000 local school kids get to come here in person every year. And then now we're reaching hundreds of thousands of kids online. So 
this is different what we're able to do. And it's because of Griffith Observatory Foundation that we're able to inspire the next generation, not just to go see eclipses, but to be involved with STEM and science. And th that's what we do here. Anyway, that's our show here tonight, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us for All Space Considered. Um, we, appreciate, we appreciate it all. And we'll see you next month.